And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. <clears throat> Coming to us all the way from the deep, deep forests of the wild sea. <laughs> Which, happen which happens to be the name of his game. The one and only Felix Isaacs. How are you doing today, man? I'm pretty good. How are you? I am, do I am doing good. Um, given the amount of force that I'm surrounded by, a, a, set a setting like this is going to hit is going to hit a little close to home. But uh, it's um, it's do it's doing pretty good. Um, it's uh, I'm still. I, w I would be I would be jumping for joy about it about it being in fall now, but um, there are no such thing as as middle wit as middle seasons around here. Yeah, well, here in England, fall just means rain. So and then again, so does summer and spring. Yeah, the th the thing that I learned a long time ago is that um, is that seasons do not exist anywhere that there's forest. <laughs> Um, now, with that said, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it in particular that made it stick for you? Um, okay. So, my first role-playing game um, was Call of Cthulhu, uh, back when I was at college. Um, mm -hmm. It was... I still remember the character's name, Arthur Greenwood. He was a wonderful character. I have wanted to revisit many times and never quite got round to, sadly. And it was yeah, run by a friend of a friend. Uh, I turned up, didn't know quite what to expect, ended up really enjoying it. And after that, uh, by the time I got to university, I was running Call of Cthulhu uh, four or five nights a week for a kind of rotating group of about 20 people. Um, after that, moved on to D&D 3.5. And then fourth, branched out into Pathfinder a little, and then... Uh, after a trip, uh, trip abroad, which left me isolated from all of my more traditional role-playing game books, I stumbled upon the fact that there are more than three RPGs in the world, mm. and uh, kind of opened my perspectives a bit. So, yeah, yeah, discovered a lot of other stuff from that. Yeah. Now, when it now, what was what would you say was the spark when it came to the creation of? The Wild Sea, and I, I'm fully aware that it's um, in active development, but I'm curious what um, catalyzed the whole idea. Well, I've been working on a very early version of the rule set ever since I've been playing Pathfinder. Um, so more than 10 years now, but it was a very, very different game back there. The idea of the Wild Sea as a setting didn't exist at all. It was just a loose bundle of mechanics, which looking back on, I kind of cringe. Um, but it is nice to be reminded of where you come from every now and then. Um, it was only when I ended up teaching in a place which was surrounded by lots of mountains and trees, and I had a lot of time to stare out the window, that I got thinking about what I would like to do as a set. And as they were um, kind of uprooting and destroying a large area of forested mountainside near to me to reinforce it, it got me thinking about the general idea of conservation and chainsaws. And I wondered what it would look like to have a setting where chainsaws, although a part of life, uh, wouldn't necessarily be the end of a forest. They would just be a minor inconvenience that would be quickly grown up for again. And that's kind of how the uh, the setting developed. Once I got the idea stuck in my head, it, it really did get stuck in there. And those old rules that I had left for a few years got picked up, dusted off, mostly thrown away, and then new roles developed. And yeah, just kind of went from there. Um, it's interesting that you that that um that you that you cite Pat that you cited um Pathfinder as um the er, as the early um, incarnation of the rules. Mm -hmm. The reason the reason I say that is when I look at a lot of when I look at a lot of the mechanics that are present that are presented thus far, the game that I'm reminded of the most is more um, narrativist games like Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, yeah. Was that, an, was that an influence in how um, Wild Sea ended up developing? 
Yeah, it was a, a really late stage influence, but um, as I said, I kind of opened my mind up to a lot of new role playing games at that point. And I realized that a lot of the things I'd been kind of stumbling and trying to introduce had already been done and been done well by existing systems. Um, I'd spent months working on the best ways to implement a system that was a little bit like clocks, but you know, I'd never heard of clocks before. So I had, I thought I was doing something novel and revolutionary. Um, and of course it turned out I wasn't. Uh, but I was pleased, I guess, when I found out, because I realized that if other people had done it and it worked for them, then it's something that I could um, adapt and just learn from their mistakes and their successes. It, while well, it may have started off as a, a far crunchier, less narrative game, uh, finding things like Blades in the Dark and Powered by the Apocalypse was, uh, and also things like um, more world building driven stuff uh, like Microscope and Dialect, uh, they really changed my perspective on the rules and they really changed how the game uh, turned out. Mm -hmm. Now, when now I do want I do want to talk about the setting of the Wildsea for a bit. Now, um, when it come, the thing that I find interesting when it comes to the technology level is, would you, would it be fair to say that it's um, it's a very, it leans a bit in the realm of um tech punk. Yeah, I think that's a that's fair to say. Um, I mostly stay away from describing a specific tech level um mm -hmm. either like before the forest comes or afterwards but obviously due to um a lot of the things that are presented in the book and a lot of the art you get a, a general idea that there's some advanced technology at least yeah it's just, bit, it's uh, just that uh, strange. yeah it's just that the techno the um way that technology develops isn't I'd say it. I'd say it's similar, but branches, but branches off from from our own because of the nature of the um, of the planet. Yes, a uh, a sudden lack of fire, or at least controllable fire, was a, a big change. I had to put quite a bit of thought into how that would um, alter the way people live their lives. Everything from cooking mm -hmm. to travel. But the main thing that I note, I notice, of course, is the fact that. When calling it a wild sea, you li you're trying to literally have a a um sea a sea full of forest. Yeah. And now one of the main things that um came, that came to mind with the way it's des it's described in layers was um Kashyyyk, you know, in um Star Wars. Would uh, he's that... ringing a bell. I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan in the world, but he's ringing a bell. Um, what well, what with it having layers and layers of um, biome, with, especially, mm. especially with all the massive massive trees about, um, yeah, would would that be a would that be a fair comparison to some aspects of the Wild Sea? Yeah, from what I remember of it, which is mostly from playing old N sixty four games, probably yes. Mm. And. It's in in the in that particular regard. Would would it be fair to say that um, when some when somebody's um, going in going in between going in between the air that they'd that they'd still have to navigate like they would um, on a regular ship. Yeah, navigation is um, a kind of interesting issue when it comes to the wild sea. Uh, you, there's there's the general kind of compass point navigation, but when you start talking about depth most ships stay uh, as up on the surface as possible. Um, but a few other things I've been working on that aren't in the playtest guide yet are submersibles. So the different levels that exist, the thrash, the tangle, the sink, and the drown. Um, some point, at, well, hopefully, at uh, some point, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, they'll get a bit more of a thorough working through so people can uh, go up and down as easy as they can, you know, left and right. Mm-hmm. I do definitely imagine each level as having its own distinct uh, problems and benefits. Yeah. Um, and of, and when it comes... Now, you've also described the Wild Sea as low magic, high weirdness. Um, <laughs> yeah. Could you go, could you go into what, what you mean in particular by weirdness in this regard? Yeah, no problem. Um, I've never been a fan of the kind of quote unquote standard fantasy idea. I, I love weird fantasy. Um, 
China Mabel's Baz Lag was uh, a huge influence on the early Wildsea setting as well. Um, and there's a lot of influences still there from that. So Weird Fantasy is definitely my bag. Mm -hmm. As for what weirdness means for the wild sea it's that i am happy to mess around with uh spirits and alchemy and all of the the non-shiny light version of magic but as soon as it comes down to uh, traditional casting of spells and things that that's where it loses my interest so there's not really much of a representation of that in the game mm -hmm. now when it now when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the uh, races, I'm guessing that um that with the with the design of the core four, you wanted to have it that they um, that there's not exactly going to be a traditional fantasy equivalent for them. Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, we ha we of course have the uh, I'd say the the closest one to an equivalent would be um the first one, the Ardent, because they're basically just humans. Yeah, they're, they're definitely the kind of the human types. Mm -hmm. um, I think of them, I still call them human by mistake every now and then, although they are uh, setting-wise distinct from old world humans. Much yeah. tougher, much more weathered. Um, but I, I try to get away from a lot of the, the kind of older school fantasy tropes, especially when it comes to a, a human population as being Oh, they're the generalists. They can do a bit of everything. They, you know, I don't find that interesting. So I specifically, with the Ardent, made them into a, a kind of much uh, tougher, much more um, varied, but with their own strong traditions kind of group. All right. Um, with the now, when it comes to the Ectus, it meant it mentions them being um. Them being cac, them being uh, cactoids. Yeah. Um. Would it? Would that? Would that apply for how for how their body is structured? That it's more, that it's very similar to a cactus in terms of um, in terms of how it endures. Yeah. Um. The actus actually are, are probably the the bloodline that get the most play from play testers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people have played various different kinds of cacti. Um. Or cactuses, whichever one it is, I never know. Um, and I've had people playing um, using the the rules for the actors. They've also played things like um, collections of uh, kudzu type vines as well. So there's been a lot of flexibility as far as like, is it a traditional cactus in the shape of a person, or is it something a bit stranger? And I like that kind of flexibility. Yeah, and the um, the gap the it's. It's also noted that the Gao are a um, are a more synthetic are a more synthetic race that's more um mushroom based. Yeah, definitely fungal. Mm -hmm. um, with the Ectus and the Gao specifically, I wanted things that because it's a very plant based world, I wanted mm -hmm. things that tied into that. But I didn't want to do uh, a more traditional kind of dryad esque or leaf based creature as one of the main races. I wanted things that felt like they were definitely part of nature, but that stood out from the general makeup of the sea itself. Yep. And when it comes now, when it comes to the last of the four, the um, oh, the Zelicre, yeah, Zelicre. Um, yeah. I was curious. One thing I was curious about is what um, of all of the of all the kind of um, or of all the kind of origins that could be done with um, that with with um um forest based races um why spiders in particular since they are a um hive mind of spiders in a way kind of reminding me of the recent spiders man which <laughs> yeah. is um I had a few people pointing that out to me as well <laughs> um why spiders in particular it's a it's kind of a hard question to answer because I can't think back to exactly what my inspiration for making it spiders by default was. Um, and I have uh, personally in a playtest game played a Melacre, which is just the Chelacre variant, um, which is made of bees rather than spiders. It's a very fun character to play. Um, but I think if I, if I kind of rack my brains and think back to when uh, the core four were first being developed, I wanted something that was inherently unsettling 
because the wild sea as a world, it's it can be played as a very kind of uh, clean, bright place. But that's not really how I see it. Um, there is an element of, of darkness to the waves. It is technically post-apocalyptic. I mean, it's soft apocalypse and the, the world has gotten on with uh, itself and pulled itself back together in the wake of the apocalypse, certainly. But um, I wanted to learn that, that appealed to people's inherent fears, I guess. A lot of people do have a fear of spiders. And in fact, it's something I've had to um, put a few warnings on the playtest document for every now and then. I've run into players who were um, eager to play, but also eager not to have spiders have such a huge presence in the game. So mm -hmm. I've been some adapted versions of that for them. Uh, the very, so at the very least, um, at the at the at the very least, nope, nobody. Can, I doubt I doubt anybody's um pick pick that so they can make bad Doctor Smith jokes. <laughs> uh, no, well, I hope not. <laughs> Which, well, it's not going to happen at my table because I because everybody at my table knows that if you try and pull that thing, then um you have to drink the pain glass. <laughs> For the record, the pain glass is a uh, gla is a glass full of bacon soda. That sounds, I mean, delicious if prepared right, but drunk straight probably not so great. Um, no, because it's it's basically carbonated bacon. Yeah, I mean, I do love bacon, but probably not that much. No, I I bought it at a candy store so solely as a um as a threat. <laughs> well, I mean, if it works for you. Well, I I don't need to break it out that often. It's just, it's more of you know the old saying about how the th about how the threat is and is a deterrent. I think yeah, carry a big mm -hmm. stick, etc. Yeah. Um. But when it now, when it comes to the concept of wild sailors, um, mm -hmm. how how similar and how different would they be to um? To regu to um, more seaborne sailors in terms of what one would expect of what they do. Well, there would be um, one of the things that I think is important for wild sailors is that they are ready to fight, but unencumbered, because there's always the chance of being thrown off the ship. Mm -hmm. Without the 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 kind of buoyancy of water to hold them up. Um, falling straight down through the layers of the sea into your death several miles below is a real possibility. Um, that means that the, the idea of them being able to climb rigging has been extended to a lot of them having the opportunity and the skills to wave walk, to uh, leap from branch to branch, just normally just to get back to the ship after being put in perilous situations. So mm -hmm. I imagine the average wild sailor has a focus on mobility, um, especially mobility in harsh terrain that more traditional real-world sailors might lack. Which, I... And, of, co of course, th that, that ends up making me ask the question... I look at the art and I look at, these lar I look at these large wild ships and there's a small part of me that asks... That's got to be a... That's got to be some thick ve vegetation for them to be able to um, hold that weight. Yeah, I get asked that question a lot, actually, about um, how do ships stay up? And, you know, part of the answer, obviously, is rule of cool. They they manage to stay up. They're, they're kind of held by the branches because if they weren't, it wouldn't be as fun. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got a ship, took it out to the sea, and it just fell straight through and smashed on the roots below, eh, less fun game. Much shorter, but less fun. Um, but... In a, in a more kind of world practical sense. I imagine the, the second layer of the sea, the tangle, is probably thick enough that it would genuinely hold um, the hulls of you know, reasonably heavy ships. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, hold them so well that you would need something like a chainsaw to cut through it uh, while propelling yourself. That's the whole idea behind the, the, uh, the most common ship type effect. Yeah. Um, now, when it... Now, um... When it comes to when it comes to um char when it comes to characterization, I'm get I know I made the comparison between um between this game and a powered by the apocalypse game, but I'm guessing that when it comes to character creation, it's not going to be based on um on ga on game books the way powered by the apocalypse is. 
No, I'm I'm a big fan of point based systems, mm-hmm. um, and although the wild sea isn't technically set as a point by system the full rules do include a, a kind of point by esque option for making characters um i'm one of those people that just loves taking options from various different backgrounds and parts of books and stringing things together in weird ways yeah. um i was also yeah. a terrible D player for the same reason i was one of those types that had a, a level in six different classes by level six yeah so it's, um it's the, way, it's the way i play so it's the way i made the game as well um well, take, taking that into account, wrong with playbook. playbooks take, can be great. They just don't suit the way I make things. Play. Yeah. Um, now, when you when you mentioned point buy, are, are we talking? Are we talking a full a full on point buy, or are we talking a segmented point buy? Um, segmented in general. Uh, there are basically certain um, options uh, for your character that you have to have a certain number of things for. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've got a bit more experience with the system, you can drop some of those options, um, put different things in different places. It's made to be as flexible as possible the way we're looking yeah. at the full rules at the moment. Um, but think of it more as a, a kind of restricted point by. Mm-hmm. For this section, you can take things from a particular section from any of the backgrounds in Origin. Yeah. Um, part, of the, part of the reason I end up asking that is whenever point by is, imp- is implemented, um, it's one of those things that has to be approached that in my experience has to be approached carefully because you can have um, the possibility of choice paralysis. And the... Oh yeah, point by is a great unbalancer and it's also great to have, especially players new to a setting based system, look at the vast array of options and go, well I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, um, which is why it, it's not the, the basic way of doing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, a bit more my mentor called it, my mentor called it swim, damn it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and of, co- of course, the um, of course the post the poster child when it comes to the extreme ends of point by will always be stuff like hero system or um, GURPS. Yeah, not ones I've actually played personally. I've never delved never delved into the GURPS well. Um, do you still have your TI eighty three because you're probably going to need that. <laughs> I never had one in the first place, though. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Some, sometimes it feels like doing point by with GURPS is is borderline doing calculus. Yeah, I don't think I'd be very good at that. Um, mm-hmm. I try and keep the numbers small in the wild sea in general. But um, something else, I, something else I noticed is, of course, having a um, sh- a um, sheet just for the uh, cr- just for the crew and yeah, uh, so, and ostensibly for the ship as well. I'm guessing that was one of the things that you had nailed down from the get-go, that you wanted to have the ship be as much of a character as the, well, characters. Yeah. Um, in fact, in the very first playtest, they made their ship before they made their characters. Mm-hmm. And there have been a few playtests since then where that's happened. Theoretically, I imagine people coming together to make their characters and then make a ship that suits them. But with the shipbuilding rules, which exist in secret places, um, mm-hmm. Where as soon as people get a look at them, they, they kind of get entranced by the options for building a ship, get distracted by that, and then make characters that fit the ship they've built. And I'm entirely happy with that. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the ratings of a um, ship, now some yeah. of some of them I can some of them I can guess as to as to what they're go, as to what they're gonna be, but there's a few that I'm curious where they uh, play where they play a factor. Yeah. Um now, the first one I'm curious about is uh, seals. Yeah, people bring up seals a lot too, which makes me think I need to write a better description. Personally, um, seals is the ability of your ship to keep the outside out and the inside in. Um, even though you're not in water, there is still many, many things that can get inside the ship that you don't want there: pollen, spores, insects. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially if you have uh, some kind of galley, you don't want that kind of thing coming in uh, whenever you can help it. Mm-hmm. And the higher your seals is, the the better your the better sealed your ship is, literally. Yeah. Um, saws. Yes, uh, the ability of a ship to cut through the waves effectively, or in a more abstract sense, to bypass obstacles with force. So if there, if you if you're ever in a, I'm guess I'm guessing this would be the equivalent of how well a ship could handle rougher waters. 
Yeah, exactly. The higher your saws are, the, the denser the branches you can cut through. All right. Now, and the, the last one that I'm cur- the last one of, of ratings that I'm curious about is tilt. Yes. This is one that um, I had a lot of fun with, uh, and it was the last one to get named as well. Um, tilt is the ability of a ship to handle the topography of the canopy waves. Um, although the wild sea is treetops in essence, it acts like a traditional sea in some ways. And one of those ways is that it has waves, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. They're static, mostly. Uh, they are the the kind of troughs and ridges and risings of branches and leaves uh, where they form denser parts. Um, there are also sinkholes, things known as rifts, and general uh, kind of and rises in the level of the sea, depending on what grounds the roots kind of um, gripped into when the trees first grew. So tilt is the ability of your ship to tackle those harsher waves to go deeper and higher when required. Mm-hmm. It's one that uh, I was. I didn't know if it was going to get included in the first draft, but then as soon as it was, people used it a lot more than I. Yeah, I got. You. Now, part of the how um part of the reason that I ma- I made the um the f- the comparison with Powered by the Apocalypse was the dice system that you're using. Which yep. is a, a D six based, um, ki- kind of, kind of a six, su- kind of success based, but not. Yeah, not it's a much. it's a success ish based system. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Where sixes are full successes, five and fours are yeah buts. Um, yeah. Three, threes and threes and lower are dis- are disasters, and doubles are another um but. Yeah, essentially. Um. Now, given given that the given that it went from a Pathfinder hack to this current form, um, what was the reasoning for going with a D six a D six pool? Uh, it was geography. When I was working on the game in its its more modern form, uh, by more modern I mean newer, not more modern as if it's something particularly you know mm-hmm. uh, cutting edge. Uh, D six dice pools are not exactly the the cutting edge of role-playing game technology. But when I was working on the newer form of the Wild Sea, I was uh, living and working in Japan. And although they have hobby shops scattered around the place, I was out in the sticks. And the only dice I had access to uh, were D6s. So relying on D20s and D10s and D8s and D12s just didn't work anymore. Um, I didn't own them. So it became a uh, D6-based model. And dice pools are for me, a fun thing to play with anyway. I had originally envisaged the Wild Sea as using D8s just to be annoying, uh, but luckily I, I talked myself out of that one. Well, if you wanted to really be annoying, you could make you could use D4s. Yes, D- <laughs> a whole host of D4s. I would love to see a game that uses nothing but D4s, but the Wild Sea is not it. Oh. Um. I'll I'll have to I'll have to cons- I'll have to consider that one of the, one of these days. Um <laughs> But now, the, now the other um, the other concept when it comes to when it comes to the die roll that I'm curious how this um, how this came how this came about was cutting, because yeah. it do, part of it does seem that it that it is a representation of difficulty, but that's not the only ver, only uh, way it can be do, way it can be done. Um, was it was was that a means to make sure that difficulty wasn't just a static number when it comes to successes and failures? Uh, yes, that is one of the reasons behind it. Uh, one mm-hmm. of the main ones, in fact. Um, cutting re- uh, cutting cuts or cutting removes. I think cuts is a terrible way to phrase it, but cutting removes um, dice results rather than dice that you're about to roll. Um, so it's it's it also gives that sense of victory being snatched away from you because you cut from the highest result down. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you roll, you know, a, a one, a two, and a six, and you're cutting one, that means that you're taking that six away. Yep. You know that you were so close, but at the last second, something has gone wrong and dropped that success down to a disaster. 
Yeah. I wanted that feeling of, of drama in the dice and also cruelty. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, um, the mantra here in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy. Yeah, we've definitely had some games where roles have been... You, you hear it from the table, like, oh, it's a six! This is the, this is the double! No, no, it's not. No, I'm cutting. Oh, no, that, that's a three. Um, so, and and uh, it, maybe it's cruel, like mm -hmm. I said, but I like that kind of thing. It, it adds to the tension. Again. Well, um, it's it's just a classic case of, of um, R.N. Jesus, who does not yeah. save. Um, yeah. Now... When it came to when it came to the mode of play thing and these and the way scenes are set up, would it be fair of me to say that um, planning adventures or set or sessions of the Wild Sea is predisposed to um, to formatting them kind kind of like um, kind of like episodes in a drama? Yes, very much so. I wanted it to be a game that could be easily played in a kind of episodic format mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons it's a very low prep game as well uh which is something i struggled with for a while especially with such a setting focus game uh but i'm really glad i i think i if not nailed definitely made strides towards making it as low prep as possible yeah um i wanted games where you could take existing characters and their ship and just throw them into something uh with minimum preparation but maximum fun it also, that kind of thing, uh, keeps the, the Wild Seas GM, the Firefly, it keeps them on their toes, which I think is pretty important. Mm -hmm. The GM isn't uh, a huge dice roller, uh, not as much as the player characters, certainly, but they do still get to experience that element of randomness when they feel like it. Yeah. Um, in, that, in that same regard, do you think that the Wild Sea um, would fit naturally playing in a um, hex crawl? I've considered the way maps work uh, for the, the Wild Sea because you know, charts are an item you can pick up. Maps are a big part of the, the game in the fiction. Um, and in, I did experiment with a hex crawl for a while. In the end, we went for a more kind of rougher area-based progression when we were using maps, although technically functionally identical. All right. So All if right. you were if you were indeed charting like your progress across um, a particular area of the Wild Sea mm -hmm. and, and visiting places multiple times, a hex map would be absolutely fine to use. Yeah, um, it's just one. It's just one of those things I could see because there's a lot of emphasis on on journeying. Yeah, and discovery too, which again mm -hmm. hex maps are great for. Yeah, being able to fill in the hexes that you've um, gone through or passed near uh, with notes for. Uh, if even if not that session, notes for future sessions can be really fun. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, um, when it comes to like, I know that you had set. I know that in the playtest version, that's that's cur that's currently available. Um, when it, when it came to characters, you ha you have it as um ki you have it effectively as kits, but. Yeah. When it when it comes to the when it, how when it comes to the when it comes to um, character creation the full version um, how are archetypes going to be a factor for the full version the the quick start kits will mm -hmm. still exist I think it helps avoid choice paralysis up mm -hmm. to an extent um, but there there's a lot more guidance on how to develop and create things for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, so as well as the option to use a quick start kit, there's the option to just fill in um, from anywhere in the book. Uh, you know, take whichever three edges appeal to you. Take uh, 15 ranks of skills and languages, split them how you like, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, but there's also the option to, hey, if there's a particular skill that you want to appear in your game that doesn't appear on the list, here is a rough guide on how to make them. Mm -hmm. If there's an idea or an aspect that you have that isn't represented in the book, is a way to make them. Yep. Now, I do have a bit of a lore question. Maybe this is something you've been asked about in the past, but given the emphasis on ver on verdant and and woodwork and um, and the trees and all that, yep. um, I'm curious how met I'm curious how metal and how machining is tre is treated in that in that kind of setup because I could easily of, oh. 
I could easily see somebody asking, well, well, if there's so much tree everywhere, how are people getting metal? A lot of the, uh, the idea for salvage and metal is that uh, the wild sea um, shifts and it, it kind of brings up remnants of the old situations that were destroyed by the roots. Those, those cities and civilizations with mm -hmm. uh, level to have metal. Um, it's scavenging those wrecks and the, the reefs of kind of broken ships and buildings uh, for supplies that's a big component of certain kinds of wild sea game. There's uh, one of the early bits of artwork I got from uh, Pierre, one of the artists I work with, who is fantastic, mm -hmm. um, was the Longjaw, which I believe for the playtest is the default ship. And the the um, the kind of cabin, the enclosed cabin of the Longjaw, specifically was made to use an old train plow inverted uh, to give it some armor plating. I just love the idea of uh, people in the wild sea dredging up things from from down in the roots, these kind of metal remnants of civilizations that no one really remembers anymore, mm -hmm. and saying, well, this is an oddly shaped piece of something, but we can use it for this. Uh, the idea of a kind of a scavenging world where they have lots of food and a, a decent amount of water, depending on how they collect it, um, and lots of basic building materials, but a... Uh, scarcity of things that are difficult to saw through, uh, things like metal, I thought was an interesting take on uh, post-apocalypse. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And also, when I when I look at the um, when I look at the packet when I look at the packages for or, for um, um, bloodlines, origins, and um, posts. Yep. Um. One of the things I one of the things I notice is that is that a lot of them, um, especially for aspects, have their own tr have their own assigned tracks. Yeah. Um, now in the in the full version, are those are those tracks going to be pre going to be pre assigned in the same way, or was that specifically for these um, quick starts? Um, the tracks are assigned in the same way, but again, there's more guidance on uh, setting tracks for aspects create as well. Um, the way aspects are made behind the scenes, not to go too much into the mechanics of the, the kind of behind the curtain stuff, but all tracks uh, or all aspects start with a five track, essentially five boxes you can mark off to represent strain or damage or whatever else you're taking. Um, and then the more complex the aspect gets and the more useful it is to you, the fewer boxes there are meaning that the, the more complex or more useful something is, the fewer times you can take a hit to it and still have it be useful. Uh, works the same way for traits, gear, and companions. If you um, see a long distance, for example, uh, that is useful, but it's niche useful. That might be a four track or a three track. Something that lets you fly at will, that might be a one track or a two track. Mm -hmm. It's something that, yeah, you can still use it, but if you take a hit to it, then it will not work. It's something that is more risky to use. Yeah. Um. Would the what now when it come now when it comes to when it comes to those tracks, um, whenever I whenever I see um some sort of mechanic with a limited resource. There's a ten there's a tendency for players to um play defensively with that resource. Yeah. Is that something that you've encountered in playtesting? Uh yeah, up to a point. Um even when I'm a player in games that other people are running at the Wild Sea, which doesn't happen that often, but it has happened more in the last few months, which has been great. Um even I find myself doing the same thing. Uh you try and spread damage around so you have access to your best stuff as possible. Well. Um, but the Wild Sea is a game that is built for telling the stories rather than built for crunching the numbers in mm -hmm. general. Mm -hmm. There's still a, a strong mechanical element behind it, um, but it is definitely a narrative game first and foremost. So playing defensively, I think, if that's how you choose to play, I, I think that's entirely valid. Yeah. Now, when it comes to some, when it comes to something like focus, um, mm -hmm. what was what was the um, what was the intent behind the creation of the focus tracker, the way the way it's uh, set up? 
Uh, the focus tracker is something that I've been using in a less official capacity for years while playing games. Uh, just a, a simple row of boxes or circles and the names of whoever's doing things. It's just so I can um, fill in who's done what. It even helped back in the Call of Cthulhu days. Um, because Call of Cthulhu, uh, the old combat rules of Call of Cthulhu were scattered. Um, mm -hmm. is, is a way to describe them, I guess, that's polite. Uh, fantastic game in terms of uh, depth, but some of the mechanics, especially for someone new to role-playing games, which I was back when I was playing Call of Cthulhu, could have been explained better. Um, and combat often, before I started using a, a kind of focus tracker, became just a, a morass of people saying, well, I'm going to do this. And me as the uh, keeper saying, OK, that's that's fine. And then five mm -hmm. minutes later, forgetting mm -hmm. who has exactly done what. Uh, the focus tracker, it doesn't track everything that happens, but it tracks whether people have had their time in the spotlight, uh, which I think is the most important thing. A game where people get, especially a, a narrative focused game, where people get left out in important scenes. That's not my kind of act. Mm -hmm. um, now, when it comes to when it comes to um, cutting, um, ha given given how the given how the nature of cutting is largely up to the GM or Firefly, um, I just mm. use G I just use GM as my cat as my catch all because otherwise I'd oh, have yeah, like I a dozen too. different terms. <laughs> um, yeah. But where, but where would you say where would you say the line is between a um a re a reasonable cut and a um less reasonable cut because something something like cutting is something I can see the potential for abuse. Yeah, a lot of it is up to the group to define. Um, mm -hmm. There there is a list in the uh, Fireflies section which gives kind of example numbers for cut. Um, in this situation, a cut of one would be good. If this is happening, cut an extra die. So, um, so there, there is a guide, but in some of the tables I've on some of the tables I've played on um, with other people in the Firefly role, I have definitely had other Fireflies uh, cutting or not cutting in places where I definitely would or would not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, as long as the table in general is fine with that, it's it's one of those things where you'll find your own pace. Now, when it now when it comes to um, resources, and I do, this is one of those instances where I do like the fact that um, what you what you can get out of ex out of exploring the wild sea is not a um, is not a one to one. Like, yeah. I, for example, I don't see anything that would be the equivalent of standard currency. Yes, I have oh. avoided currency. I mean. I guess I guess maybe if I wanted to stretch it, I could I could go I could go with um I could go with some sort of chips in the same way that say um the Fallout series uses bottle caps as currency. Yeah, in earlier versions of the game, there were two different currencies, um, but they both got dropped in the end. Mm -hmm. um, one of them still exists in concept, and one of them still exists as part of salvage and specimens. But, yeah. Uh, for a while, it was amber. Um, from the trees, but then I realized that an economy based on amber in a world where trees are everywhere uh, might collapse pretty quickly. Um, and then after that was Scratch, which is uh, still there as a concept, I believe, in the rules, which is just the, the, the thought that you always have something on you to pay for the minor inconveniences of life, like a bed for the night or a drink. Mm -hmm. um, just those, yeah. those odds and ends in your pockets. Uh, Chips of amber, old kind of nuts and bolts that you've got from a wreck, uh, apple cores and seeds. Kind of but eventually I realized that the economy uh, barter base was just the way to go, I think. For a game so much about salvaging and attaining and defining what you find as you play, uh, the seems the best. In that regard, would it be fair of me to say that whispers are a more social resource? It can be, but we have to experiment as having whispers as being just as tradable as everything else. Um, in fact, I, I listened to a playtest last night. Uh, I wasn't a player, I was just there as a kind of fly on the wall type, where they were discussing the trading of uh, rumors for rumors, which mm -hmm. was all whisper based, and then rumors for salvage. And the concept behind a whisper as being uh, living words inside your head um, 
which arrays themselves once they're spoken or transferred it means that they, they really can be used as a kind of bartering material. It's not just disseminating basic information. It is a, a specific, powerful word which can be passed from mind to mind. So if you want to trade that for food or shelter, I suppose you could. Mm -hmm. Although they are, as you say, often used as a more social resource. Yeah. Now, of course, I'd also note... I'd, um, now, one... Now, given the... Um, given the nature of the uh, of the uh, wild sea vessels yeah i'm cu i'm curious if you've con if you've considered um combat between ships yes it's one that's come up um i can't remember offhand if the rules for massive damage are in the playtest uh, cuz we've been playing with them on the private tabletops for a while mm -hmm. but uh, ship to ship combat is something that's come up a few times. Ship to person combat is generally very quick and very bloody. Uh, ship to ship combat is a lot more about maneuvering and using your ratings effectively, mm -hmm. and is based around kind of uh, chase and escape a lot of times, um, or smashing ships together and repairing the damage afterwards. Yeah, but it's something a lot of playtest groups seem to want to explore. So it's definitely something that I need to put more effort into as the uh, work progresses. Mm -hmm. Um, the main the main reason that I ask is that in the bestiary for the book, um, at least the one I've got in front of me, um, there's notion yeah. of certain um, pirates. Yes. Um, yeah. The uh, one of the reasons I, I want to develop uh, ship to ship combat mm -hmm. in general is because people do really like boarding pirate ships. I don't know what it is about them, but people love doing it. Whenever pirates turn up, crews are just drawn to boarding their ship in some way. And that normally doesn't involve getting close, so your combat generally into you. Yeah. Now, some now when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to equipment, um, one thing I'm curious about is we we did delve a little bit into tech level, but I want to delve a, a bit further on when it com when it comes to when it comes to this. Um. Would. Would would um would it be fair to say that com that combat within um within the wild sea favors um favor favors firearms or favors more melee um equipment or is or it, does it not discriminate? Uh, it depends on the kind of engagement you're in. There is the choice when you're choosing your um kind of weapons if you do in fact choose weapons because some mm -hmm. characters don't um. To get them does CQ damage, which is close quarters, or LR damage, which is long range. Uh, but there's no cost difference in the um, A lot of it's situational. I would, when I first imagined the, the Wild Sea, it was very much a kind of pistols and cutlasses type world. So I assumed most people would have a close quarters weapon and a long range weapon. Long range for as you're running into an engagement, and then close quarters for, you know, when you suddenly hit the enemy and then. Uh, you're kind of in the melee. Uh, mm -hmm. But the way a lot of games have played out is that people have found their their own particular style um, as to whether they want to engage at long range or close quarters and work with their group to maneuver opponents into the right kind of space to do the most damage. And I'm entirely happy with that. So I, I couldn't say whether it, uh, the game favors one or the other. I think a lot of games tend to favor the um, versatility that comes with long range, but in a place full of branches and leaves and smoke and spores, it's long range might not be as useful as most people think. Mm -hmm. Now, when it now um when it now um it's now the current version that you have is a um play, is a play test essentially a quick start or a preview version of yeah. The Wild Sea. Yeah. Um, do you, are do you, is what's going is what's going to be coming down the pipe in down the road? Um, a updated version of that. And when are you are you building this? Are you building it up to um to to put it up on crowd to put it up to put the full version up on um crowdfund down the line? 
Uh, yes, we are aiming for a Kickstarter, hopefully by the end of next month, if things mm -hmm. go well, which would be lovely. All right, and um, just, just to make sure I don't um, tempt the gods of irony. <laughs> yes. you, but now when it comes to when it comes to something like um impact um yeah. i'm cur i'm curious how um i'm curious where the line where the line is when it comes when it comes to that to determine what would be low normal high or ma or um massive impact a lot of the times we've played, impact hasn't really come into the game that much, unless there are specific aspects based on it. Most things are assumed to be of normal impact. Things are going to be low impact, and the Firefly points it out. Most people will just reconsider their action. Um, but every now and then, high impact does come into play. And it's it's mostly a narrative tool, uh, or it's as much of a narrative tool as it is a mechanical tool. Um, I tried to keep the the hard numbers out of those kind of things. Because um, I feel it gets in the way of naturally evolving stories when you have to start considering like, oh, that door has five HP. Do I do enough damage, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so impact is more about the the kind of effect your actions have in terms of dramatic flourish. In many cases, I think yeah. the uh, the rules as they stand talk about the difference between uh, slamming open a door and kicking a door off its hinges. Slamming open a door, yeah, normal impact. Kicking a door off its hinges, the door is still open. You haven't technically done more but it's a lot more impressive and it may lead to more dramatic options in the future yeah now when it comes now when it comes obviously the um the full book is going to be in flux but what are what are you shooting for as far as a as far as a page count for that book around 200 pages yeah pretty happy with there's about uh, 150 pages done of the full document at the moment. And by done, I mean reasonably ready to show people. Uh, it's what we've been using uh, behind the scene. Um, so a lot of the work is already done, which I am happy with. But there is still a lot more to do in the future, um, especially because there are things as the game gets out to a wider audience. And I've heard a, a big influx, small in terms of the internet, but big in terms of me personally, uh, a big influx of people playing the game and getting to me with feedback, I've realized mm -hmm. that there are certain mm -hmm. aspects and areas of the game which I glossed over or mostly ignored and that people really, really want to know more about. So mm -hmm. uh, probably aiming towards a 200 page book for the final, yeah. probably. But, but, you know, don't take that as a guarantee. And in that, re in that regard, is one of the things that's planned a, um, a demonstration of a hub area? I, I, I what a um what a decent... I've been working on uh, over the last few days mm -hmm. is a, a reach, which mm -hmm. is a, a pre made area of the sea. Comes with its own factions, um, particular areas with their own distinct uh, geographical and topographical characteristics, uh, and uh, pre made um, people and places and things. In some ways, it flies in the face of how I naturally play the game because I like to make things up on the fly and I like uh, the, the kind of element of randomness, especially that comes from the journey roles. Mm -hmm. um, but that is not how everyone plays. And I'm trying to uh, change my design philosophy slightly to make the game as accessible as possible for different tables and different groups. So having a, a pre-made area is fun for me in terms of writing setting, but it does feel weird after being intentionally vague about many things throughout the game as to say yes this is a person they exist in the world so all of that stuff uh, in terms of having a, a pre-made area you can use as a hub or a pre-made sea that you can jump into um, with specifics it's uh, nothing you'll ever have to use but it should be there as an option yeah i, I look at it as a um as a net you can you can go. You can go with it. You can go within it, or you can use it to um, branch out of. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to think about. It. There are a few places, especially places. There are a few that have turned up in multiple playtests with multiple people. Um, for example, the the twin reef cities of Kither and Kinner, where no one quite knows which one they're on or which one has which name. Mm -hmm. They've turned up in so many different playtests. There's nothing really in the book about them or in any of the documents been published about them but they just keep turning up so they'll make it in there eventually yep. and to 
when it comes to when it comes to the um because you've been play testing this for a good amount of time what would yep. you say some of the learning experiences you've had um from the from the feedback you've gotten um one of the big ones that was a yeah definitely one of the big ones for me was realizing that people were going to uh push the limits of or push the way they used aspects and edges far more than i ever assumed they would um also skills technically i suppose uh, but i intentionally created aspects to have um a general description usually and a single mechanical purpose over the start of playtesting the way aspects can be used has gotten a lot broader because a lot of players inherently when faced with the challenge would comb through their sheet for anything that might give them an advantage on that and aspects came up again and again um people using their traits and their gear in unexpected ways and it came up so often i just incorporated it into the game Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I love seeing people being creative with what they've got, especially if what they've got feels inherently restrictive, yeah. um, starting with only six aspects as you do. But, but seeing people realize they can use those aspects for various different things, as well as the mechanical purpose they're there for. And that's all from Plato. And, I'll, and um, I will note that I'm getting that. I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how the um, full the full book um, presents itself, mm. but I'm glad. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, hopefully you too. <laughs> it's your book. <laughs> I mean the the design of the the even things as simple as the page design changed so much over the past uh, year or so. As I said, I've been I've been working on the system on and off for years, but and working on the setting for about three in a very vague way. But it's only over really the last kind of year to year and a half that it's really come together and become mm -hmm. something serious. Um, yeah. So I've, I've done more work in the last year than I had in the previous three or four because suddenly it became a thing which might actually go somewhere rather than just a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. And, well... The the only the only thing that the only thing that I ask is um please have an index. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh there will be an index. It's um something that is it's not the first time it's been mentioned to me. Uh there there weren't page numbers in a lot of the previous editions as well and that once it got to the kind of hundred ish pages thing, I realized that having a contents page and page numbers in an index would be essential, especially mm -hmm. if something set. <laughs> so it's coming, believe me. And with, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and and enjoy the um, crazy. Yeah, no problem at all. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I can get behind that. <laughs> um, even if even if I even if I prefer. Dr um, drinking be um, something other than wine. Well, there's a lot of weird things to drink on the wild sea, so maybe you'll get a chance at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and of and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!